Thank you. Hello, Sunrise. Well, this is way more production than I imagined initially. Um, thanks for being here. Today, I want to take you on a journey through the uncharted waters of AI, arts, and creativity. So to start with, I want you to imagine that you live in a world before the camera. This is a world where the only way of capturing images is by drawing them or painting them. For reference, this is around the early 1800s. This is also a world before electric light, before the telegraph, before the telephone, before the automobile. So you get a sense of what the setting is. And now imagine that this guy, Louis Daguerre, I'm probably mispronouncing his name terribly, but he invented this machine that he very humbly called the Daguerreotype. So the Daguerreotype was a machine that took light in that little hole and then printed an image on a metal film. And this was the first experiment with photography. This is a photography that he shared with the world. And what was even more magical about this is that he did not share his process with the world originally. He kept it secret for around three years. So you can imagine how magical this looked at the time. Eventually, he did share his process, which led to the development of the camera. And you can imagine that this period of time between a world before the camera to a world after the camera was full of excitement, but was also full of fear and resistance. And people very quickly realized that this was going to impact many areas of human life, from how we consume information, how we entertain ourselves, and of course, how we make art. And it's in this particular point that there was a lot of resistance, because people were thinking around these two camps. What you make with these machines is not art, or this machine will kill art. And some people were at the intersection of both. And one of them was Charles Baudelaire, the French poet, which has a great essay uh, from 1845 called On Photography. And he said in that essay that photography is the refuge of every would-be painter, every painter too ill and out or too lazy to complete his studies. And he has some great quotes in that essay. He said, I just want to quote a little bit of that for, for you. He said that the developments of photography, like all other purely material developments of progress, have contributed much to the impoverishment of the French artistic genius, which is already so scarce. In vain may our modern faulty roar belch forth all the rumbling wind of its rotund stomach, whatever that means. He said that poetry and progress are like two ambitious men who hate one another with an instinctive hatred. And when they meet upon the same road, one of them has to give place. If photography is allowed to supplement art in some of its functions, it will soon have supplanted or corrupted it altogether, thanks to the stupidity of the multitude, which is its natural alley. So, of course, now in retrospect, we would not be able to say that photography is the refuge of ill and down painters or lazy painters. Of course, especially when we see the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson and his decisive moment, the work of Steve McCurry, the work of Annie Leibovitz, or the work of J.R. and his large-scale photographic installation. What happened instead is that photography emerged as a new art form in itself that was enabled by the camera. But not only that, it actually contributed to painting directly and indirectly. By freeing it from the need for realism in painting, it actually enabled new art forms pushed painting to explore more abstract, emotional ways of capturing the world, like Impressionism, Expressionism, or Surrealism. But not only that, the medium itself as a technology kept, develop kept developing and gave rise to one of our most cherished art forms, like film. And the same thing has happened with other technologies. For example, the MOOC synth, initially, well, the first synth, it was initially banned for use in commercial applications because people thought that this would completely kill the music industry or would kill musicians. Um, and actually, Robert Mook, the creator of the synth, he had strong views about this and he said that people thought that this was a sort of musician in a box that you can make any sound just by pressing buttons, but that instead this was an instrument that needed to be mastered like any other instrument. And of course this is what happened, it just became a new instrument in the ecosystem of musical instruments and it actually enabled the rise of some of the coolest art forms in music like disco music and electronic music. So fast forward to 2022, until very recently we were living in a world before computers that can make images and could make text, and very soon video and music. 
For example, this image was just created by typing an astronaut riding a horse in a photorealistic style. This is one of the first images, so I think this will go down in history as, you know, sort of the hello world of text-to-image models, sort of like Daguerre's first photograph. And I just want to show you a little bit of what computers can do now. So if we just go to my laptop here. Here we go. So this is DALI. Um, so let's say a painting of the Sydney Opera House at sunrise <laughs> in the style of Ukiyo E. So this might be the next flyer for next year's conference. We'll see. <laughs> So this is what we, I don't know if I love them. I think I'll generate again. Doing testing, I generated some that I like most. But we'll see. And you can see here all of my previous experiments. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I think kind of like this one. Let's just go with this one. But I think we're missing something. So let's say, I'm going to delete that bit. I'm just going to go sunrise. And of course, a blackbird <laughs> flying through the sky. Let's see. The suspense. So there we go. I think I kind of like this one. It's a kind of a weird bird. I kind of like that bird, if it is a bird at all, or that one. So maybe this could be the flyer for the next conference. But not only computers can do these sort of things now, just from language, it can also generate more language. And this was the original generative models. And I'm going to show you something that we can do with GPT-3, also by OpenAI. So let's just say, write a haiku about sunrise and a blackbird. <laughs> and we can try again. The blackbird perched on the branch as the sun slowly rose in the sky. I'm not sure if it complies with the metrics of haikus, but let's just, let's just give it to the model. And so if we just go back to the slides, please. We can imagine that this transition from a world where computers could do that sort of stuff that I just showed to you to a world where now computers can do this sort of thing, it's actually scary and interesting, exciting, and there's also a lot of resistance. And again, people are starting to realize that this is going to influence many aspects of human life, like how we entertain each other, how we consume information, how we sell things, how we relate to others, and of course, how we make art. And again, the resistance in this particular last point can be grouped around these two camps. What you're making with these machines is not art, or these machines will kill art, and some people believe both. But what I think is that actually this signals that AI is following a similar arc to other new mediums. I think this is how we should see AI as a new creative medium. So what I want to show you now is a few examples of how we've been using AI as a creative medium. Some of these will involve some live interactive demos that I hope they work. Um, so the first one is an exercise on using AI as a medium to connect with the missing. So Back in 2018, I founded a collective of data scientists, engineers, artists who were using and misusing AI tools to address social, economic, and environmental problems from a multidisciplinary perspective, including an artistic perspective. And an organization in Mexico called Data Civica, they approached us, and they had collected a database of people who had gone missing or had been killed um, in the war on drugs in Mexico. And what they wanted to do was do an art installation that rehumanized them and that was a tribute to their memory and that was also a call to justice. So they gave us this as a brief. So what we thought is, well, we can use and actually repurpose, misuse face recognition technology to create an experience in which a visitor of the installation comes into a booth and then they get matched to the person in the database that most looks like them. So started doing some experiments, 
So this is me just testing it out. This is also an early experiment. Uh, one person that, that was recognized as the person that most looks like me probably doesn't look as much as me. But what's interesting is that it actually has my same last name, and I have no idea who this person is who went missing on 2018. We eventually kept developing the installation, which was called Cara Cara, or Face to Face. Um, we opened it to the public. We had a series of events where we talked about the problem, how we needed more data, better databases for missing people, and just talk about generally the problem of the war on drugs and violence. We had the families of people who were in the database and talks. Um, this right there is Diego Luna. I don't know if you know him, but he was in Star Wars. In, uh, uh, an actor in Mexico, uh, and he was kind of facilitating the talks. And we had some shocking results. Um, some of these, I think, are very similar. So as you can see, some of them are it's a uncanny similarity between these people. And of course, people were very moved and very touched. Some of them came out of the installation in tears, asking what they could do and how you know, they can begin to understand and, and, and help address the problem. So we actually timed the opening of the installation with a large protest that happens every year in memory of the victims of the war on drugs. So we actually gather a large collective of people to come to the protest. So there was actually action. People were moved to action after seeing the installation. The installation also just traveled around Mexico. It went to international film festivals, to museums, and we actually created also another experience which, we, which used VR to create a 360 dome with all of the faces, so you could see all of the faces in the database. So the next exercise that I want to show to you is actually something that I did in 2022, where I wanted to explore the same narrative thread, but instead of connecting with those who are missing, connect with those who will never be. So I became interested in using DALI, the tool that I just showed you, to generate realistic portraits of people that were very expressive, very human, and that had a sort of cinematic composition. So this is a video of the process that I followed. So you just generate hundreds and hundreds of images of people. You usually start with a very close close-up of the face, and then you expand from there. You erase the surroundings, you change it, you change the prompt, you try different things. It's a very iterative process that actually takes multiple hours until you generate something that you like. And I generated hundreds of these portraits and eventually selected around 10, which I like the most and share, share them as a series of portraits that I called possible people. And these are a few examples. I gave each one of them names. This is Jamal. This is Mila. This is Avish. And the idea of this portrait was to ask the question um, if I wanted to understand if we could connect with people, we can generate a strong sense of connection with people, even if the person looking at this portrait knows that it's an artificial human, knows that this person does not exist. Can we evoke, even neurologically, a sense of connection with these people just by looking at their eyes and their human expression? And what does that mean? If you connect with artificial humans, does that strengthen your capacity for connection and empathy, or does that deplete it uh, and devalue it so you are not able to connect as meaningfully with real people? That was sort of the question. I don't know the answer yet. And actually, the portrait of Jamal was exhibited at a gallery in Sydney. Um, if we just so this is, this is Johnson, who's just sitting there. <laughs> this is the only video I have of the gallery. Sorry, I didn't document it very well. But I believe this was the first time that a DALI-generated artwork was exhibited at a physical gallery in Australia. And then, actually, the Australian ran a story about this artwork and how it was exhibited in a gallery. And what was very interesting is that they assumed that this person was a man. But the intention of this particular portrait was that I was trying to generate someone that had no gender. That's why I like this portrait so much, and that's what I was trying to do from the beginning. And they just took it, and they just ran a story that said, this man does not exist. They just completely assumed he was a man. So it actually served as a way to mirror our own social biases. The next experiment that I want to show you is also about connection, but this one is about connection to our surroundings. So in the 60s, there was an exhibition called Cybernetic Serendipity, 
which was one of the first exhibitions that took the computer as a creative medium seriously. They invited a series of engineers and artists to submit artworks that were using art. This is one of my favorite ones. It's called Return to Square. It was done by the Computer Technique Group, great name, from Japan. They were a collective of artists and engineers. And it seems very simple, but it's actually very complex, especially with computers from the 60s. They started with a square, and they're just using equations. They turned it into a shape of a woman, and then came back. Um, if you're a programmer, try to do this. Try to start with a square and then try to create a woman like that. And it's actually very hard. Now imagine doing this with a computer from the 60s. Anyway, now in 2022, the School of Cybernetics at ANU, founded by Genevieve Bell, they wanted to do a modern version of cybernetic serendipity to inaugurate their new building, their new shiny, fancy building. And they created what's called Australian Cybernetic, which is actually going to open on November 22. And they contacted Uncanny Valley, which is a company, a music technology company, that actually won for Australia the first AI Eurovision contest back in 2020. And they contacted the Interactive Media Lab, where I'm doing my PhD, uh, along with my supervisor. And they gave us a brief. They said, we want to turn data into a soundscape for the foyer of this new building to uh, be the first thing that people see when they come into the exhibition. So the first question that we had that they didn't have an answer for is, well, what data do you want to sonify? And they were like, just choose whatever you want. So we went back to this diagram, which is a cybernetic concept created by Stuart Brand and Brian Eno, one of my all-time idols which conceptualizes systems in human civilization in these six layers. Everything exists in six layers. The deeper ones change the more slowly, but are the more fundamental. The, the outer ones, like fashion, but this also includes art and includes other things, they change more quickly and they're less fundamental, but they're all interrelated and they all affect each other. So we said, well, how can we find data sources that relate to each of these labels? So we found these ones after a lot of searching. For nature, we found Emissions data, live emissions data of CO2 in the atmosphere. For culture, we had the most read Wikipedia articles. For governance, we had World, Public, World Bank public sector data. For infrastructure, World Bank infrastructure data. For commerce, also from the World Bank economic data. And for fashion, we mapped it to social media, which changes at a similar pace to fashion. It's just very, very quick. And now the question was, well, how do we turn them into sound? So there's a lot of approaches that you can follow. One of them is you just map the data values to music values. So when something in the data goes up, something in the music goes up as well, like a pitch or the volume. But we wanted to do something more meaningful, something that actually conveyed the emotional content of the data into the sound, so that when you read the data, the feeling that you get when reading the data about emissions data, about Wikipedia articles, was mapped to the soundscape. So this is what we did. We Created a library of sounds, actually, on Candy Valley did that. Um, they composed sounds. They were all human-made sounds, a library of thousands of sounds. And then we asked people to label each sound according to how it made them feel. And then we access the real-time data. And then we pass this to GPT-3, the AI model, and ask it to describe how does the data feel and why. That's what we asked. And then we generate some text that describes how the data feels. And then we match these two, and then we generate a soundscape. And then we also generate a visual depiction of this. So we have the six layers. You can see the text here. I'll just go in um, uh, the next slide. You will be able to actually see the text. But we have a visual depiction of this. And then actually, you can interact with this visual depiction and each of the layers becomes a string in an instrument that you can play just with your movements. So you can move your body without touching anything. And there's another machine learning model recognizing your hands. So you can actually play the strings. Um, and the notes that you're playing in the strings depend on the local weather. So there's a lot going on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the sounds that you can play in the strings depend on the local weather. If it's nice outside, like it is right now, it's going to be a major scale. If it's gloomy and cloudy, it's going to be a minor scale. So if we just go to my computer for a second. Oh, well, this is a video of the installation. Uh, and actually, that green dome has gone. Uh, it's kind of quiche with those <laughs> green plants. But you can see that I'm just using my body to play the strings. And then the visitors of the installation can just see the text that is describing how the data feels to the model. So if we just can switch back to my computer to show some things. Um, 
So I just want to show you an example of what sort of stuff the, the model is generated. So I'm not exactly sure if you can see that. I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger. So the data that we're passing in this case is just an example. is the data for, for November 5th. And the Wikipedia data, which is the most read Wikipedia articles of that day, is about the cricket, about Elon Musk, Justin Verlander, YouTube, Jeffrey Dahmer, the Netflix series of this horrible guy, take off the rapper, Jared Piquet. And we asked GPT-3 to describe how this data made it feel and why. And what we got is the data made me feel curious because I want to know why these are the most read articles today. I also feel a little bit uneasy because some of these topics are quite dark. Example, Jeffrey Dahmer. Lastly, I feel excited about so this cut off. Excited about the Cricket World Cup and suspenseful about who takes the medal. <laughs> and this got matched to this audio label, or this audio that was labeled as eerie, suspenseful, sexy, inquisitive, and reflective, which was this audio file, the bass. So we can actually listen to it. And you'll judge if it's actually eerie, suspenseful, sexy, inquisitive. So that is just one of the layers in the soundscape. This is matched to the culture layer, but each data was mapped to a particular type of sound, and then you layer the sounds, and then you create a soundscape. And I also want to show you a bit of how it actually looks, and let's see how so this works. So this is actually, you can just go to this is systemofasound.art, and you can interact with the camera or with your mouse. So if you interact with the camera, you can just So the sound that you're hearing is being generated uh, via the method that I just uh, told you about. And then the strings are being played with just my movements. And the particular sound that I'm triggering depends on the weather outside. It's also being collected in real time. So if we just go back to the slides, please. So the last example I want to show you is using AI as a medium for inspiration. So, so in early 2022, I created this little app. It's part of my PhD. It was a very simple experiment that I called Narrative Device, where you give the model or the app two themes, and it generates the beginning of a story. And I just shared it on Twitter, just not thinking too much about it, and it went absolutely viral. It blew up in like two days. I just shared it like, hey, this is what I've been doing in my PhD. And it just went absolutely viral to a point that I had to turn it off because the compute costs were getting out of hand. And I just posted on Twitter, hey, if you want to donate some money because I've run out of credits in my server, and people rushed in, they donated money, and they helped keep the app up and running. And they generated really the funniest things. For example, this one, which probably you cannot read, but I'll read it for you. Um, <laughs> They gave revolution and chicken fingers, and the story was, the revolution is coming. I can feel it in the air. The chickens are restless, clucking and scratching at the ground. They know something big is happening. I can't wait to see their little faces when they realize that they're finally free. I don't know what will happen when the revolution comes, but I'm ready for it. I've been stockpiling food and weapons, and I've even been learning how to farm. I know that we will need to be self-sufficient if we want to survive. I can't wait to see the look on my neighbor's face when they realize that the chickens have won. They'll never call me chicken fingers again. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one, I also really love this one. Uh, someone input, Evangelion and transgender. And it said, the giant robot Evangelion towers over the city. Its imposing presence, a reminder of the power of the military industrial complex. But to 14-year-old Shinji Ikari, the Evangelion is more than just a weapon. It is a symbol of hope, a promise that he can be something more than the scared and confused boy he is today. Shinji's life is about to change in ways he never could have imagined, as he's chosen to pilot the Evangelion and defend the city from the alien beings known as angels. But Shinji soon realizes that the Evangelion is more than just a weapon. It is a symbol of hope, a promise that he can be something more than the scared and confused boy he is today. As Shinji begins to understand the true power of the Evangelion, he also comes to terms with his own identity as a transgender man. And then this other one was a little bit sadder. It's, it's not it's funny, but this person said, this was just what I wanted tonight. So perhaps this found her at a moment where she needed 
something to help her grief. She input a daffodil and grief, and it said the daffodil lay on the ground, its stem broken. He had been hurt in the fall, and his petals were withered and brown. The child picked up the daffodil and cradled it in her hand. She was sad, and the daffodil was sad too. They were both grieving. And then this other person, who apparently was writing Top Gun fan fiction, was also using it to write his fan fiction. And now I'm also doing some experiments with combining these models, so GPT-3, to generate the stories in, with narrative device, and then passing that input into a stable diffusion and generate an illustration for it. So I create another version called Illustrated Narrative Device that you can find on my website as well, or on my Twitter, or just Google it. So now, the last example that I want to show to you is something that we're all going to do here together on stage, so hopefully it works. So if you can just go to this link or scan the QR code, and you'll see a form. And what I want you to do, please, is just ask your neighbor what are three things that they love the most in the world. It can be anything, it can be very playful or you can get very deep. Just share some things with your neighbor that you love so they input it. Don't be shy, we just want to generate a little bit of interaction. <laughs> if we can just switch to the screen again, to my computer, sorry. So we're seeing in real time the stories come. <laughs> uh, wow, I love this. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Make it a bit bigger. LSE. Wow. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, this talk. Thank you. <laughs> this is great. I've never done. I've never done this. This was a complete experiment, uh, and it's working. Uh, it's it's not the end. You'll see. You'll see. Oh, there's an emoji there. Cool. AWS. <laughs> All right. So while it's still filling up. I'm going to go here. All right, so connected. Let me just check. Are people still sharing stuff? Well, you can keep. All right, I think we're good. Anyway, so what I want to do now is take all of his responses, pass them to GPT-3, extract the main themes, and then pass that into DALI to generate an artwork that is going to be an artwork that we all created here. And then you'll be able to download it and maybe sell it as an NFT, whatever you want. <laughs> Frame it, print it, burn it. Um, so we'll see. So this is the code bit. So right now, don't worry about this. I'm just reading all the responses. Takes a little bit. There we go. All right, and now I'm just going to cut it in chunks because it's very long. So this is just some pre-processing of the data. Cut in chunks. So how many chunks do we have? Oh, that's perfect. And now I'm gonna just going to call GPT-3 and ask it to do a thematic analysis. And I give it an example of what sort of thematic analysis I wanted to do. And then we'll get an idea of what sort of stuff people like the most in the audience. A lot of food. <laughs> AWS. <laughs> cool. And now I'm going to call Dali and I'm going to pass it these themes and then ask it to generate a painting using a red, warm,
color palette combining the style, styles of Frida Kahlo and Rodko that express the following theme. So let's see what we get. Oh, no. Oh, because it has sex. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we'll fix it. <laughs> uh, that makes sense, though. We'll solve it. We'll solve it. All right, pressure's on. <laughs> I just have to delete this. <laughs> Again, wow. This is censoring. All right. Let's see. This is just one example. We can regenerate again if we don't like it. This is a collective thing. <laughs> so it's the styles of Rodko and Frida Kahlo. So I don't know if you've seen Rodko, which is just color, and then Frida Kahlo, which is surrealist. I don't, what, do you, what do you think? Should we generate again, or should we just go with it? All right, all right, all right. What's that? <laughs> a different style? What style? Dali, okay. In the style. It's going to be wild, probably. <laughs> Hmm, a lot of food. Do we like it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to upload this to a Google Drive, and you'll be able to download it and do whatever you want with it. There we go. Uh, what's happening? One second. Or I can just... There's always a way to solve it. Save image. How do we, oh, I was going to call it share humanity. All right. Replace. And then, <laughs> here we go. I'm just going to load it here. So if we go back to the slides, please. So what we did is we took the RDC, put pass to GPT-3, extract the main topics, create a prompt, and generate a DALI image. And if you go here, if you scan this QR code or to that link, you can download the image. If you want to share it on social media, tag me if you're so inclined. You can find me. This is my website, so you can find my contact details there if you want to have a chat. Um, and yeah, just download the image and do whatever you want with it. It's, yeah, I think it's the first of this kind of experiment that I think well, at least I have done. But yeah, we all participated, and then we changed the style. I wasn't expecting to change the style, so thanks. It was definitely better. Um, and just to close, I just want to go back to something that Margaret Bowden, a uh, creativity researcher, said that was that creativity is an exploration of the possibilities in the creative space, or it's an exploration of the creative possibilities in a terrain. And new tools are like vehicles that allow you to explore new areas in the creative space. So I think AI is just a new vehicle that lets us explore new areas in this creative space that we never had access to. So with anything, it's just about more, it's about the journey, not really the destination. So thank you so much for coming on this journey with me, and thank you. Thanks, Frodo, for a really... Uh, <laughs> thought-provoking presentation. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Brendan Yell. Um, hello, travelers out there. Uh, we're amongst friends here today, so you can call me Yelly. Um, Roto, look, uh, we are, AI is often sold to us uh, as, let's say, taking out all the menial tasks and allowing humans to 
pursue higher things. Mm. Um, isn't art the higher things? Shouldn't maybe AI leave it alone? Well, again, I think um, it's a tool for humans to keep doing art, which is definitely what we want to keep doing. We don't want to take that away from humans. We don't want to automate art. So I think if we look at AI as a tool that we can use to keep making art, it really changes the narrative. And it's, I don't think, I really don't think it's going to replace art or that you know, we're just going to sit back and just let AI do art because it's about the journey. It's about the exploration. It's about the making, not so much about what we make. Um, it's about just being creative and using these tools in cool ways. So there's, humans always go one level of abstraction above to what the tools do. So if the tools are able to do these images, then you're going to operate at another level of abstraction. You're going to think about how you use these images. And you're going to think about the narratives and how this relates to narratives that are relevant for humans. So I think, yeah, definitely we don't want computers to be doing, you know, taking away the arts. We do want them to be doing the menial stuff. Cool. Well, I mean, art's got r rules, right? You know, laws of composition, color palettes, those kind of things. But actually, when it comes to it, the best art that we ever see kind of breaks the rules. Like, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, right? It's in six parts. It kind of makes no sense. Um, but it's, um, and it's six minutes long, but it's somehow it's fantastic. Can we teach the AI to also break the rules? That's a good question. I think so. Yeah, I think... I mean, if you look at the stuff that GPT-3 does, uh, like a lot of, like... For example, the, the story about um, the chicken fingers and stuff like it's very kind of left field. Like you're not imagining that that's gonna be the story. So I think it is good at breaking the rules, and I think that is really where creativity comes in. It's actually breaking the rules and not following, you know, predefined steps, which computers are really good at and have been really good at. They just follow the algorithm that you give them, and you know they don't mess up anything. But these sort of technologies are kind of non-deterministic. You input something and you don't know what you're going to get. So in this case, for example, we, you know, we input a prompt and then we got something that we had no idea. I had no idea what we're going to get with that image. So it is, in a way, breaking the rules. And I do think that it can get to a level of cognitive complexity that it does stuff that looks like it's breaking the rules. Cool. I mean, we've got a question here from the audience. Um, it's a great question. What does copyright look like with AI art? And is this the property of the input or the end? Yeah, oh, that's, that, that's really interesting. I think one thing that I find a bit problematic, or very problematic, is that a lot of these models are just trained with data that is just out there for free. And then a lot of these companies are selling the access to these models, and they're kind of profiting from selling access to the model. But then the people who train the algorithm with their own data are not getting anything. So I think we could find new models of copyright in which you sort of distribute the profit. So it's not all centralized in the company. So imagine if you contributed some artwork to the model, you could have a way of computing how much your artwork influenced you know, a particular set of things that were generated, and you can get, get a sort of payout. Maybe you can implement this with sort of blockchain technology. So if there's anyone out there that wants to do that, I think that could be really cool. We're seeing that. So a lot of companies emerging, exploring these models from an open source perspective, like Stable Diffusion is one of them, um, and Stability AI. So they're basically trying to replicate what OpenAI is doing, and actually not, not only replicate, but actually beat it, but in an open source way. So the model, like, it's owned by everyone. So I think we should think of completely new ways of, 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 of doing copyright. I think we have to reinvent it again, because I think it's a distributed network of creativities the people who contributed the artworks to the model, the people who, the engineers who trained the model, the people who are using the model, like in this case, me, but also maybe if we wanted to set, sell this artwork, who, who would own it? Would it be me or would it be the, the, the creators of DALI or the people who said, you know, change it to DALI style? I think it's just a distribution. And I think, going back to a little bit of my PhD research, um, that's one of the premises that, I, that I'm using in my research that was also part of my PhD supervisor's ideas, um, that actually we should think about creativity as a network of actors. It, there's no creativity happening in a vacuum. It's always happening in a network of interaction. So when you're using music, you're creating music, you're using an instrument that someone else invented, you're using a scale that someone else invented, you're using a language that someone else invented, you're always using stuff that, that, that someone else invented. So thinking about this long creator is, I think, is the wrong way of framing creativity. Um, will AI art, um, AI-driven art devalue the work of human artists, and how does it detract from our humanity or 
change its definition? Yeah, I'm not sure if it will devalue the work of human artists. I think it might do actually the opposite. Um, sort of, you know, you're going you're gonna to sign a label to stuff that was created by a human and that's going to have a premium to it, like we do with handmade stuff now. Like, oh, this wasn't made by a machine, it's handmade, so that has a premium. And we actually value it more. And we're going back to stuff like vinyls and analog technology, you know, because we're kind of, you know, this commoditization of music, for example, with Spotify, we want to go back to something more tangible. Stuff like. So I think something similar might happen with AI and people are going to be like, you know, this is all the AI generated stuff. It's going to happen with music, it's going to happen with movies and stuff like that very soon. But there's going to be like music that was entirely generated by human and music that was completely generated by AI. But there's going to be also a mix. There's going to be music that was created by a human and an AI as well. Like it is now, like you're using a synth and you're using samples. So it's, it's not really like, a, there's not a line really. It's like a spectrum of, you know, involvement. And again, it's just a network of, of creativity. You're, you're using tools in different ways, in different degrees. And there's a lot of automation already in arts, uh, digital arts. Uh, and they're all valid and uh, digital arts, you know, like illustrator and stuff like that, people doing art in there. I don't think that devalued the work of people working in oil. Um, so I think these tools, they just find a new niche in the ecosystem of creative tools. So I think that's hopefully what will happen. Cool. The next question is about uh, NFTs. And um, just so people know, uh, in Paris, uh, a few weeks ago, the world's first NFT gallery opened called NFT Factory. So uh, check that out. It's full of screens. They can change the artwork in a second. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, the question is, is it ethical to sell NFTs that you made with AI art? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, why, yeah. I guess the question is why would it be different than if you, if you made it with, you know, Illustrator? I think it's the same Photoshop. question as the copyright question. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's again, I think what I, I'm excited about NFTs. I'm not generally super excited about NFTs, to be honest. I know there's another session on NFTs, but <laughs> I think what's very excited about NFTs is that since you're implementing it with blockchain, you can create these distributed ledgers of payouts, basically. So I think you could implement something in which, okay, I created this artwork with an AI model, I sell it as an NFT, but automatically in the blockchain, it validates how much contribution in this artwork there was from this other artist. So everyone just gets a little payout automatically. I think stuff like that would be really exciting. I think that would be the, one of the killer applications of NFTs. Um, not so much just selling a, a PNG, yeah, um, I think yeah. we're still trying to figure out yeah. where the use is. Um, yeah. An example is for uh, Penfold's wine, right? About 20,000 bottles produced per year. Uh, in China, they found there was about 200,000 bottles. Uh, they're now talking about maybe with a bottle of that wine, you actually get an NFT that proves that that wine is kind of legitimate. So there can be some alternative uses there. Um, this question is, uh, so unlike other new mediums, AI art requires conventional art to advance but normal artists can't work nearly as efficiency. Um, how do we solve this tragedy of the commons? Like other, so I'm not sure if I understand the question. Yeah, I'd request. I think it's almost asking how do how to, how to, how to real artists compete um, you know, when they can't produce anywhere near as, uh, as prolifically or efficiently. Right. I, I don't think it's a matter of efficiency with arts. It's not a matter of speed. You know, there's people who make art, just they just do one brush, and that's, that's the art, and that's valid. There's people who take years to make a single painting. I don't think that's really the right framing. And sure, you can make an AI image in a few seconds, but you can also make an illustration in a computer in a few seconds. You can also just use a sample, put together five samples, and create a song. I think what matters is the meaning that you're giving to it, the storytelling that you're giving, that you're giving to it, the narrative that you're putting around it. Um, and again, I think mediums coexist regardless of their efficiency. You have people working with oil, you have people working with, with uh, line of print, you have people working with stone, all sorts of mediums, and they all have different speeds. So because one is faster than the other doesn't mean that one is more valid than the other. So I think I'm excited to see a world in which painting is still thriving, even if people are doing AI art stuff. I don't think they're going to compete because w what is the competition really? Like, I think. In terms of design, for example, in graphic design, I think there's the, the real problem, potentially. Because sure, like, if we want to create a, <clears throat> a flyer for the next year event, 
maybe you don't have to hire a group of designers to do all the designs. You can just use it with DALI. It's way more efficient. It's way cheaper. So I think in this case, in commercial applications of design and art, I think that is what the real tricky thing is. And that happened with other mediums as well, photography as well. Uh, when photography came around, people stopped doing por painted portraits and they just took photos. And that industry basically died. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in commercial applications, yeah. So I'm optimistic about the prospects in art, but in commercial applications, I think there are some critical perspectives that we need to take as well and really understand how the adoption of these technologies are going to impact real people's jobs. Now, are you a stickler for the language? Like, I've heard people that all work in AI argue about the language. Where does machine learning cross over to AI? What is your preference with the language, and where do you believe that machine learning does cross into AI? Um, I think it's, it's mostly the same. Uh, the traditional classification is that machine learning is a s uh, subset of artificial intelligence. So machine learning is you're just teaching computers to learn stuff automatically without actually teaching them to do something. But artificial intelligence is a wider view uh, that you can actually teach computers to do certain things, kind of programming. This is called classical AI that was you know, around in the 60s, and people were trying to like, program very clever algorithms that could solve very complex problems uh, that seemed intelligent. But I think right now, the overlap is pretty much like 100%. I think all of the AI that we see now is machine learning. All of the things that we saw today and all the things that are coming out today involve machine learning because we realize that that's the most efficient and the best way of teaching computers to do things is just giving them a bunch of data using very powerful computers and just train them, yeah. sort of using reward functions and reward and punishment to the computer with math mathematical rewards. Uh, so I think now the crossover is pretty much 100%. Yeah. There's a bunch of tools out there at the moment that'll help you, that'll use AI to write copy for your website or copy for your ads. Uh, Jasper's one that comes, comes to mind. Um, do you see AI art being used in commercial uses as well, like for advertising? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's already being used, yeah, for images and stuff like that. And one thing that I keep saying to people uh, is that we will start seeing content that was generated by AI we wouldn't even know. Like, I think, for example, there's a lot of incentives for companies like YouTube and TikTok and stuff like that to create automated content using AI. So you're just going to scroll, and there's going to be an AI-generated thing there. Yeah, the not knowing thing's tricky, right? Exactly, and I think that one is also a bit troubling because you know they want to maximize the time that you spend in the platform. So they're going to be, you know, they're already using algorithms to do that. So if that now not only they're curating the the, the feed, but they're also generating the content. They can generate very addictive stuff, yeah. and I think that's a bit tricky. But we're also going to see movies like being entirely generated with this thing. I, I would give it five years, ten years maybe, just to be more conservative, but you're going to see full movie just being generated by, by an AI. It's going to write the script. It's going to generate the video. Like you can see, we can generate a script with GPT-3, and then a video is just a sequence of images. So there's already models that do images. And people are already working in this sort of stuff. And with some early results, it, the, the videos are kind of crappy. But it's just going to advance so quickly. And in a few years, we're going to have full movies. Yeah, I was in a hotel. And I was in Singapore last night. And my hotel, actually, as I checked in, it uses facial recognition to give me access. And then I started to realize that the WhatsApp assistant was very efficient. And it, I actually thought someone was there that mm. was that good. So uh, yeah, the not knowing is kind of tricky. Mm. And I don't know, yeah. do we care? Um, so if you're a startup. What, is, what does this mean to you? How do you, how do you approach what you're building and what your mm. problems you're trying to solve with uh, yeah. and include AI in that conversation? I think what's happening now is that we're going to have a new platform emerging, which is all of these models are the co foundational models GPT 3, Stable Diffusion, DALI 2, and there's going to be more models. You're just going to be able to call via an API and you're going to do the fine tuning for an outer layer of application. So there's these big companies training these models, it takes a lot of compute power, a lot of money, a lot of data. So probably as a startup, you cannot compete with that. They're going to be training the models. Their business model is to sell this as a service. So you can use the model, and then you can adapt it to your particular use case. So let's say that you want to use it for legal applications. You're going to use GPT-3. You're going to do a fine tune of that, which is retraining it for your particular application. You can design an interface, an interaction model, particularly for the problem that you're trying to solve. So startups are going to be adopting niches using this technology. And I think it's what's happening is we're seeing a new platform emerge like we did with the internet. So people were building stuff on top of the internet. They're building websites. And then with, with uh, mobile computing, with smartphones, this was a new platform. So people were building apps on top of it. And the startups were working at this outer layer of application to a particular niche. I think something similar is going to happen where AI is going to become a technology as a service. And startups are just going to take the technology and adapt it to the particular use case. 
Awesome. Please join me in thanking Roto. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate.